Well, today we're going to teach you to think like a detective. You know what detectives do? They go around and they look for clues. And they try and figure out what happened in the past. You know what else they do? They ask questions. They ask lots and lots of questions. So I want you guys to get good at asking questions today. Don't be afraid to ask questions. You know, today in detective school, you're going to learn two golden questions that could help you be really smart. And you're going to learn four other questions that are going to make you experts in figuring out what really happened to these things. What happened in the past, what the facts are, and what the fairy tales are. And so don't make the same mistake I made when I was your age. You know, I thought, you know, if I ask questions, people will think I'm not too smart. Well, that's wrong. It doesn't matter what people think. What matters is what God thinks. And the sooner you figure that one out, the better off your life's going to be. Right, parents? Yep. It takes a while to get to that point, but it's true. Yep. And so, just ask those questions, and, you know, if you don't know something, that doesn't mean you're not smart, that just means you haven't learned it yet. No big deal. And also, if you're confused, chances are other people are confused, and, uh, and they're going to be real happy that you have the confidence to ask those questions. So the key to being a good detective is ask questions. Ask questions, and there's some really good ones in here. And there's the golden question that can make you really smart. Two golden questions. You guys wonder what they are? You guys know what they are? You want to know? I'm going to find out who is a detective in here. All right? There's clues that you all have that could lead you to a golden question. The first person to raise their hand and ask a golden question gets this dinosaur. Who knows what a... Oh, there's a hand back there. What's the golden question? You don't know? Okay. Right back there? Yeah. What do you mean by that? Very good. Oh, wait a minute. That's not the golden question. Oh yeah, it is. Yep, come on up. Come on up. Yep, come on up. You're right. You're right. You picked the second one. Come on up. He's a natural born detective. Very good. Very good. And the other golden question is, could you help me understand that better? And this is a time for you to yell. I want you to repeat that after me. Re say it with me and say it as loud as you want. This is your time to yell. <laughs> could you help me understand that better? Try, to, try it with me. Could you help me understand that better? And if you want to yell at this time, go ahead. Could you help me understand that better? Ask that the rest of your life. You're going to learn so much. And then the next one is, what do you mean by that? Again, you can yell this one out. But what do you mean by? What do you mean by that? Okay, one more time. What do you mean by that? All right. So I'm going to use the word assumption. Okay. And I'm going to use the word assumption. Who knows what assumption means? Not too many people. Okay, so... I'm going to say, what do you mean by assumption? This is one you can yell. Okay, one, two, three. What do you mean by assumptions? Go ahead and yell it. What do you mean by assumptions? All right. Well, an assumption is something you think is true, but you don't know it's true. Okay, you think it to be true, but you can't prove it. All right. And so I want everybody to be, understand what's going on today. So when we leave those doors, we can go out and win. Just think of me as your coach. You're all on the same team. And when we go outside those doors, you know what we're going to do? We're going to think like a detective. We're going to figure out what really happened and figure out what the truth is. Do you know how we win? We win by helping other people figure out what the truth is, too. Helping them learn how to think like a detective. And you might be thinking, who's in sixth grade here? Anybody? Fifth grade? Sixth grade? Okay, you might be thinking, I'm just a sixth grader. Who am I going to influence? How about a fifth grader, a fourth grader, a third grader, a second grader, a first grader? Yeah. And a kindergartner? Who's in kindergarten? All right, you might be thinking, I'm just in kindergarten. Who am I going to influence? A preschooler. See, yeah, somebody will listen to you. But you know what, boys and girls? If you have the answers to this topic, I think grown-ups are going to listen to you. Who knows what the topic for today is? Dinosaur. Really loud. Yell it out. Dinosaur. One more time. Dinosaur. That's right. If you know the answers to dinosaurs, I think grown-ups are going to listen to you. That's right. Do you see the dinosaur there? Yeah, this thing blinked, it roared. It's not a real one, but it sure looks real. And notice that car in the back there, that red car. Do you see that one right there? Yeah. That car is stopped. It's not stopped at a red light. It's not stopped in a parking spot. It stopped like it was on a busy lane of traffic. This is W Street down in Pensacola. It'd be like like Second Street out there, or, or uh, Ninth Avenue, or University Drive, where it's just traffic, no place to park. He stopped in traffic to look at the dinosaurs. Do you think he's going to listen to your answers? Yeah. yeah. I think he will. I think he will indeed. 
And now to help us figure out about dinosaurs, I need somebody who's five years old. Anybody? Anybody? Now this might show up on YouTube, so make sure it's okay. Who's five years old? Raise a hand. Come on up here. Come on up here. Are you brave? Are you willing to be publicly humiliated in front of everybody? Yes. Yeah. All right. That's what we like. That's what we like. Okay. What's your name? Riley. Riley? Okay, Riley. How old are you? Five. Okay, Riley. How old do you think I am? I don't know. Take a guess. Twenty. Twenty. Twenty? Yeah. Who are your parents? Over there. Oh, I like the way you teach this kid. I like the way your kid thinks. Okay, uh, Riley. How do you know you're five? Because my mom told me I am. Because your mom told you is. That's one way of figuring out what happened. Well, what's true is eyewitness testimony. We can trust your mom. Yes. Okay. All right. What's? Do you know another way you can tell how, how old somebody is? Yes. Oh. I know. I know how old Bradley is over there. He's 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 eleven years old. He is good. Oh, who's in fifth or sixth grade? Who's the oldest? Okay. Do you know another way to determine how old somebody is? Come on up. Come on up. Come on up. What's your name? Zach. Zach. How old are you? Uh, twelve. You're twelve. Okay. Besides your parents telling you, how do you know you're twelve? Um. I'll give you a hit and you get a piece of paper when you're born. Oh. Birth certificate. Birth certificate, that's right. Eyewitness testimony, historical documents are really good. Do you know another way? Uh, judging how big you are. Do you know what this is? Oh, a driver's license. Yeah, a driver's license. Do you have one of these? No, but I'm going to get one soon. Do you have one of these? No. Well, do you guys want to drive the car someday when you get older? No, you got to have to. You do it whether you do. Not if they don't trust you, they won't. They ain't going to give you the car if they can't trust you. Well, that's true. That's right. You know how you can get the car when you're older t tomorrow? If I get a car tomorrow? No, how if they're going to let you drive the car tomorrow in the future. You know how, you can, uh, you know how you're going to be able to drive in the future? Probably average. You take care of your bike today. <laughs> you take care of your bike. You take care of the stuff you have. You see, they can trust you. All right? You're going to be known by your actions. If your parents can't trust you, you ain't getting in the car, right? Right? And one of the things, and I had, I taught junior church from that age and younger and older, and I would, and this might be a shock to some of you kids, the world doesn't revolve around you. Is that a shock to you? Yes. <laughs> it's a revolve around God. And your parents, God has something for your parents to do, and you're either helping them do it like a sale, or you're holding them back like an anchor. So do you think you're more like a sail or an anchor? Anchor. Yeah, we can work on that. And you know how you can get to be a motorboat? That's when you go up to your mom and say, hey, mommy, how can I help you? Daddy, what can I do for you? And you can be a speedboat by looking and seeing what needs to be done. Like your toys are laying around, you pick them up and put them away by yourself. Your clothes are laying around, you put them away. And ask your parents. And then you're going to develop a relationship, and you're going to have so much fun. Because if parents can trust you to do what they say, like my sons, I was able to teach them how to kayak. Doesn't that look fun? Looks like a lot of fun. They could get hurt out there if they didn't do what I told them to do, but they did what I told them to do, and we had a lot of fun. You guys know who this is? John Wooden. He won seven championships in a row, eight out of nine, 10 out of 12, my opinion, is the best college coach ever. You know what he told his players? He said, no swearing. He did not tolerate it. He said, be on time. And he said, don't criticize your teammates. And you know what he was told when he was young, like your age? His dad told him, don't lie, cheat, or steal. Can you do that? Don't lie, cheat, or steal? Yeah, can you do that? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> All right. Can you do that? Yes. Good. How about this one? Don't whine, complain, or make excuses. Yes. Oh, that's good. Can you do that? Yes. Okay, good. Now, this guy is a football coach from Clemson. Devil Sweeney. He won two out of three. And he gets off the field and he says, Hollywood couldn't do this. Only God could do this. I just bring this up because that's kind of rare. Football coach. Put a slide in this building. I think that's kind of cool. $54 million building. Puts a slide in there. You know what he tells his players? He says, wrong is wrong even if everyone's doing it. Right is right even if nobody's doing it. So do right. Okay. And now we'll move on. I want to know what you guys know about dinosaurs. 
This, we got a partial list. Let's fill this in. We've got, they turned into chickens, they're big, they ate meat, and they died in the ark. Do you have anything to add? They can be scary. Can be scary, all right. Do you have, any, do you have anything to add? No. All right. Well, here you go. Oh, gravity works. All right. Thank you for your help. Thank you. I appreciate that. Let's give them a hand. All right, now the rest of you. What do we know about dinosaurs? Or what? Okay, go ahead. Um, Stegosaurus' plates help control their body. Okay, the plates. They got plates to regulate heat, all right? Yes. Go ahead. They can eat you. Yeah, they could eat you. All right, anybody else? Big teeth, yeah, they sure do. How about... Did they live millions of years ago, or thousands of years ago, or what? What do you think? They, they would, they had three different er, er, eras of their life. Three eras? Okay, how long were these eras? Was About it? a million years. Millions, all right. All righty. Anybody got anything else to add? Yes. They're old. They're old, how old? Millions of years, thousands of years, so, what? Okay. Who wants to put a number? Who thinks millions? Who thinks thousands? Okay, so we got thousands and millions. One more. Strong. All right. Okay, there we go. That's good. We got a good list. Now I'd like you, let's see here. We're going to go through some of these detective questions. And this is when you, they're inside your sheet. Okay. How do you know that? How do you know that they turned into chickens? Can this be verified? Okay, that's a big question mark. Okay, how do you know that they could eat you? Because they're big. Because they're big. All right. Yeah, they're big. Do elephants eat you? No. Elephants are big. Okay. Ele I mean, we're making some assumptions there. Elephants are big. That's not going to eat you. All right. Um, yeah, they're oh, we'll, we'll talk on that too. And millions of years. How do we know that? Okay, yes. By how old their bones are. By how old their bones are. Okay, we're going to talk about that too. All right. And we've got other ones. Are you making any assumptions? You guys want to, let's practice that one. Yell it out really loud. But let's do the other one. This one's a really good one that I want you to get good at. Let's practice that. Say it with me. Yell it with me. How do you know that? One more time. How do you know that? Well, again, how do you know that? Exactly. When you're being taught, that's a valid, valid, fair question. How do you know that? Is it, are you making any assumptions? Let's ask that one. Are you making any assumptions? Rilla, are you making any assumptions? Okay. Now, there's a big assumption over here that there's no God. Or at least he didn't do what he said he did. And there's an assumption over here that there is a God. And he did communicate clearly. And so what you're going to see, and has this ever been observed? Has this been observed? Has anybody seen millions of years ago? No. Okay. Has anybody ever seen thousands of years ago? No. Okay. So it's a possibility. So there's a, what you believe determines what you, you think about dinosaurs. Another one is, let's practice this one later on. Where did that come from? Really loud. Where did that come from? Where did that, one more time. Where did that come from? Yeah, good deal. Yeah, they, they found huge dinosaur footprints in every continent. Even Antarctica. Even Antarctica. How do you get something that big that eats a lot of food to grow in Antarctica? What do you think? Um, that it, back then it wasn't as cold as now. Back then it wasn't as cold as now. That's interesting. Okay, we'll get to that. Does anybody know what? That's my son. Do you know what he's holding? A fossil. A fossil what? Egg. No, it's a toe bone. Why did the dinosaur have such a big toe? Because he had a really big foot. Why do you have a really big foot? Because big leg. Why do you have a big leg? Because he was huge. If he was in this room, he'd be sticking out the top. You know, they're as big as a barn, as tall as a silo, and if they stepped on you, uh-oh. <laughs> deeply impressed, or depressed, one of the two. Right? And this little kid, he'd taken a bath in one of those dinosaur footprints. And there's a big controversy about this place called Glen Rose. It's not a person, it's a city. Do you know what state that is? 
Texas, Glen Rose, Texas, there was this big flood. They got this park called Dinosaur Valley State Park. And we went down there because hundred some years ago there was a big flood, ripped a layer of bedrock off the river, and guess what they found? Dinosaur footprints. Yeah, dinosaur footprints. I took those pictures, they're still there today. But you know what they documented in the past? Human footprints with the dinosaur footprints. Very controversial. You're going to have to study this out yourself. There's good sources out there to talk about. But what does it say? 18 to 20 inch foot. 18 to 20 inches. That's a big foot. This is a copy of it. 18 to 20 inches. My foot's 11 inches. This was, the thing that made this had to be a giant, right? Was there giants in the earth in those days? Yes. Well, according to the Bible, there was. Genesis 6, 4. There were giants in the earth in those days. They used to have these signs up there, giant men tracks. You know, they deny that they ever existed. But people don't get that big today? Well, actually, they do. You ever heard of Robert Wadlow? Yeah. Just east of St. Louis in uh, Alton, Illinois? He was 22 years old, and he was 11 feet, 8 feet 11 inches. 439 pounds, and his foot was 18 and a half inches. So he had a foot like this. So it's genetically possible for humans to get that big. And he was the world's largest Boy Scout. Seven foot four, 270 pounds. I don't know how he fit in the bus. He must have had the whole back toe two rows. He was huge, right? Yeah, so humans could get that big. And this was, he died in the 40s, I believe. And so, yeah, you can get really big. Okay, ding, ding, ding. Here comes a scientific question. Where did dinosaurs, everybody wants to know what happened to the dinosaurs. I always ask, where'd they come from? So let's ask one of these questions. Ding, ding, ding. Say, yell real loud with me. Where did dinosaurs come from? One, where did dinosaurs come from? One more time. Where did dinosaurs come from? You know what that depends on? It depends on what you believe. Do you believe what God says in the Bible? That's what the picture is on your handout right there. God made that. Does the Bible tell us when land animals were made? Does it tell us when dinosaurs were made? Yes. How do you, what day? Who said six? There you go. The sixth day. God made the land animals. Was, were those land animals? So the Bible tells us that the land animals were made on day six. And then, and then he made all these other kinds of animals. And they all produce after their kind, after their kind, after their kind. Is that true? Is that what we observe out there? Okay. But if you don't believe what God says in Genesis, and some people, I don't want to burst anybody's bubble, but did you know there's some people that don't believe in God at all? They don't believe in God at all. So if they get rid of God, now where do they get the dinosaurs to come from? They came from that single living cell. Billions of years ago. You know, 3.5 billion seconds equals 110 years. And what this says is roughly 6,000 years that's uh, 6,000 seconds is an hour and 40 minutes. Do you know there's a difference between an hour and 40 and 110 years? There's a big difference. Okay, so it again. What, and the question, you know, and we can ask those scientific questions. Let's ask, how do you know that? One, two, how do you know that? Yell really loud. How do you know that? Yeah, how do you know the dinosaur came from that single living cell? Has that ever been observed? No, it's not been observed. So we've got to separate what's, what's the fact and what's the fiction. How about, God, how about this, where God made everything in six days? Has that ever been observed? Yeah. God observed it. And if you believe that he re revealed it in a book, that's the assumption. We, re we believe that God revealed himself in a book and we can understand it. Okay? And, so, and the assumption here is there's no God. There's no God. So then when it comes to... Uh, how did life begin? Ask that question real loud. How did life begin? That's a hard one. If you believe in eternal life giver, yeah, eternal life can make life. But how do you get life from non-life? I'm going to show you this video so you understand how complicated life is. When Darwin came up with this theory right here, it's called evolution. You ever heard of that? Yeah, yeah evolution. He thought that the cell was as complicated as a ping pong ball. And he said, we don't know how life began because we don't know enough. Well, now we know enough, and we really don't know how life began. Cells are full of specialized components that perform functions vital to their existence. But how do these components get to the right locations inside the cell to perform their functions? For larger components, a transportation system is needed. 
Meet the Kinesin. Masterpieces of micro-engineering, Kinesins are miniature motorized machines that carry cargo from one part of the cell to another, walking along self-assembling highways called microtubules. Now, to, for somebody to believe that life came from non-life, they have to believe that chemicals learn to walk. Don't they? That's happening hundred in your cells right now, 100 trillion times over. In every cell of your body, that's happening right now. So they have to believe that chemicals, they might be able to make chemicals of life, but they start to teach them to walk. I saw that and it's like, they're walking on these microtubules to where they're supposed to go. It's like, well, where do, how do these microtubules know where to go? And my son saw it and he said, where do they get the energy for that? And that brings it to this. It's been called one of the wonders of the molecular world. An amazing nanoscale machine. ATP synthase is a high-tech micromolecular power generator inside the cells of your body. It generates adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, an energy molecule that provides fuel that every one of your cells needs to function. Without this fuel, your cells will cease operation, and so will you. We need it to live, but how, you know, how, did, we, how did we live before it evolved? You know, I was at a park one time playing baseball with the kids and a bird flew into a backstop one time and you look at this bird that's knocked out and, we're saying, and I said, boys, where'd the bird come from? And they said, from the nest. And I said, well, ultimately, you know, where did it come from before the nest? From the mommy bird, mommy daddy bird. Well, how, where'd they come from? Mommy daddy bird. We could have done that for millions of years. And I said, where'd the first bird come from? And I think it was Matt, I think. He said, uh, God made them. And I said, yeah. But you're going to go places where they're going to tell you that God didn't make them, that he, they evolved from something. So I want you to ask this question. What evolved first, the heart or, heart or blood cells? And they said, the heart. And I said, how long does a heart live without blood cells? Well, blood cells. How long do blood cells live without a heart? You didn't notice how it had to be. Oh, now I'll give you. Heart and blood cells, same time, same place, in all the billions of years, in all this big universe. How long are they going to live without lungs? Or a brain? or a digestive system, or a nervous system, and you see how it has to be fully formed, fully functional, right from the get-go, or it's dead in the water. And, and the interesting thing about that is, if you go down to the Becker power plant, you're going to see some of the things that are in our cell. The ATP synthase machine has many parts we recognize from human-designed technology. A rotor, a stator, a drive shaft, and other basic components of a rotary engine. The ATP synthase is one of thousands of elegantly designed molecular machines inside your cells that make your life and all known life possible. ATP synthase, an example of intelligent design. incredibly designed and for somebody to look at that and say it came together by chance random processes anybody ever been to Mount Saint or Mount Rushmore anybody ever been out there how many people think that the wind and the waves and the lightning and the snow put those faces on there no it was designed obviously designed you know there's four of them there that's one clue and yet we're supposed to believe there's people that'll tell you, yeah Mount Rushmore didn't form that way but guess what my wife and kids did just popped into, and my wife and kids is a lot more complicated than a rock. How about if you were walking down the beach and you saw this, right, the Sandman? Did you think, oh, look what the waves and the wind and the, and the lightning did? What do you think? Somebody made it, right? Yeah, somebody made it. Well, in this picture, we obviously believe the Sandman had a builder, the buildings had a builder, the clothes had clothes maker. My son, did he have a creator? There's gonna be people that say no. The most complicated thing in the picture came together by chance. Now, I have a hard time believing that. And, but how do they do this? When you go off, and this is the college textbook. I got ripped off and paid 100 some bucks for this, 110 or 85 or something. And I thought, well, I'll sell it back. You know, I'll go through it and I'll sell it back and they won't take it or else they give me 10 or something. But anyhow, this book says, for life, it says it's got three paragraphs where it's too hot, tremendous heat, Oh, because this is a fuzzy word at the top. To the best of our knowledge, that's a fuzzy word. Watch out for them. The back page is full of fuzzy words. Okay, it's too, too hot, no ozone, no protection from the sun, 
The rain on the rock for millions of years. Do you see that? Rained on the rock for millions of years. Basically, they think we came from rocks. Rained on the rocks for millions of years, but then how do you get life from non-life? One real scientific word. Can you see it? Real scientific word. Somehow. Somehow, despite this harsh environment, living organisms appear about 3.8 billion years ago. Who's got a detective question that you can ask right about now? How do you know that? Exactly. When you see that in the books, how do you know that? How do you know that? That's what God said to Job. Were you there? Okay, how do you know that? And, they, and this book is full of fuzzy words when it comes about our origins. See, our, where we came from is not a science question. It's a history question. It's what we have here, two views of history. It's not science versus religion. It's science built on one view of history that acknowledges God versus science built on another history, view of history that doesn't acknowledge God. There's a battle going on. And if you want to hear man's word, what would you look at? Or if you want to learn God's word, what would you look at? Bible. The Bible. That's right. What else would you do? Pray. Pray. Good. What else? Where? Go to church. Yeah. These are all things that are going to help you to understand what God says. If you don't want to know what God says, what can you do? What can you do if you don't want to know what God says? Or if you want to learn something? What? <laughs> well, would you learn about God on TV? Would you learn about God in the movies? Not most of them. Would you learn about him in the museums? Depends. Depends on the museum, but the vast majority are over here. So this is going to teach you man's view. So if you want to learn God's view, you need to listen to the creationists. And the, it's excellent. The YouTube, if you don't know something today, it's because you don't want to know it. Because everything's just a click away. All right, and we talked about the fuzzy words. Might have, could have been. These are all in the back. This piece of paper should be your science bookmark. Whenever you're taking a science class, this should be in there. So you can ask those critical thinking questions. How can you tell a Bible, a Christian textbook from a man's textbook? What's the big clue? What do you think? Fuzzy words, and also more specifically, there's the fairy tale warning in there. Who can find the fairy tale warning? Millions of years and billions of years. Are you gonna find that in the Christian book? Somebody that believes what God says? No. So just if you want to figure out what perspective the person is coming from, you just look for millions and billions of years. Their perspective is God didn't do what he said. That's one view of history that doesn't believe what God said, their view of science. And here's another view of science that does believe. And let the games begin. There's a lot more funding over here, but if you have the truth, we're doing actually better at science than they are, the creationists are. How about this? We just had a big snowstorm. Did a snowman pop up? In your yard? Don't be absurd. Nobody made us. We evolved by chance from snowflakes. I mean, that's just absurd, right? But what's more complicated, you or a snowman? Exactly. If a snowman couldn't evolve, how in the world did you evolve? And so, okay, and then again, let's yell this one out really loud. Are you making assumptions? One more time. Are you making any assumptions? All right. And the big assumptions that they're making over here is that there's no God that single living cells turn into plants, animals, and people, that life came from non-life, and matter comes from nowhere. Yeah, you guys ever heard of the Big Bang? Yeah. Big Bang, where nothing popped into, popped into existence? I was at a, or a friend of mine was at Wayne State University, and he gives these talks. And a professor comes up to him and says, you shouldn't even be here. You're taking your faith and your religion, and you're passing it off as science, and you're confusing the kids. And Brian Young says, well, sir, can I ask you a question? He goes, sure. He says, where did this subatomic par particle, you call it a singularity, come? It supposedly had all the matter in the whole universe in it. Supposedly blew up 13.8 billion years ago. Sir, where did that come from? And the guy says, uh, we don't know yet. Science has no explanation. Ah, science has no explanation for where that come from? He says, no. And he says, oh, sir, well, uh, let, correct me if I'm wrong, but you believe in that particle by faith. He didn't like to hear it, but it's true. You're believing in the Big Bang by faith. It's not observable, not testable, not repeatable. You can believe it. That's an assumption. But you can't know it. And so whenever you hear about the Big Bang, I want you to listen. To, think about this guy. He's going to make a sparkler. He thinks he has it all figured out. You know, like this, and it should just sparkle.
for a little bit. We've got this protective cloth down here. And actually, I think I'll turn the light out so it shows up better. He learned something the hard way, didn't he? Yeah, he thought he had it all figured out, but was he right? No, no, no. And that's the fairy tale that's being promoted in our government schools. Once upon a time, nothing exploded and turned into people. Right? Right? It's a fairy tale for grown-ups, right? And I got that poster, and I went to St. Cloud State with it. How do you think it went? I've had a lot of signs there. And this was the one that somebody actually picked up and threw it. Because, and that, that's not a bad thing, it makes them think. If they can think. See, my position when I go to St. Cloud State is, hey, I'm just here to give people an opportunity to think. And you need to see both sides if you want to think. But in your classroom, you're only being taught one side. And so that's why I'm here. Give it fair so you can think about it. We, last semester, we showed a creation movie every week, every Monday almost. Creation Science 101. Explore with open minds not limited to theories of blind chance and random collisions of atoms. And so we're trying to help people figure out what's true and what's false. We've got Grace Campus Fellowship there. If you guys know anybody who's in college, have them look up, check out our website. Stop by to our events. We're trying to get it going at the Technical College. We did get it going at uh, Brainerd and try and get up there once a month. And this is the fruit of our labor. Notice that little guy there, going to all the campuses. I met him a year ago at St. Cloud State. He's a Hindu from Nepal, grew up in an orphanage, was on the street until he was 10, became their national champion when he was 14 in judo. He was champion for three years and then became the, the Sambo champion, so he's competing internationally, living in an orphanage, washing his clothes in a river. He's got a story nobody can tell. And I shared the gospel with him. He accepted it. And he came to church. He kept coming to church, and now he's, uh, he's going to Pensacola Christian College. But anyhow, if you want to make a donation, just write out to Pensacola Christian College. And uh, that's where the money's going. And this is, and on the back of that site there, there's a page on the back of this. You have my website. And you can hear him give his testimony at one of my talks under the audio section. And so there is a battle. And praise God, there's one. And they're getting taught God's perspective. Okay, so now, when did dinosaurs die? We got two different views here. Who thinks millions of years ago? Okay, who thinks thousands of years ago? Okay, well, what does the evidence indicate? You know, if they find soft tissue in a dinosaur bone, soft tissue can only last at the most a million years, at the most, in perfect, pristine environment. But do they find fossils in Hell Creek, Montana, in perfect conditions? No, it's hot and cold, hot and cold, hot and cold. How many people knew that they found dinosaur blood and dinosaur tissue and dinosaur bone? It's the find of the century and it's getting swept under the rug. So we'll have the person who discovered it tell you what she's, she found. Is that amazing to find this kind of soft tissue in a fossil this old? And what can the soft tissue really tell us? Um, well, it is, it is, it's very amazing. It's uh, utterly shocking, actually, because it flies in the face of everything that we understand about how tissues and cells degrade. Uh, it's not something that any one of us could ever predict or hope for. Notice um, that. A very amazing, utterly shocking, flies in the face of everything we understand about how tissues degrade in the millions of years perspective. But in the thousands of years perspective, it's no problem. We're not shocked at all. And now notice how they're going to say the fact of 70 million years. The fact of 70 million years. They aren't going to change that date at all. It doesn't matter what they find. They're not going to change the fact of 70 million years. And one of the exciting things about this discovery, correct me if I'm wrong, is the fact that this stuff was fossilized as it was. At 70 million years old, you don't expect to find soft tissue, do you? Not at all. No. It's, it was utterly shocking. So you have to sort of rewrite the book as far as fossilization goes, I, I assume. 
Well, that's that's the exciting part for me. I've always been very intrigued by how uh, how things change in going from a living being to part of the rock record. And um, like I said, a lot of our science doesn't allow for this. All of the chemistry and all of the molecular breakdown experiments that we've done don't allow for this. So our science doesn't allow for it. No, their science based on no God doesn't allow for it. But science based on God does allow for it. And so analogy I've got here is I've got an ice bucket right here, okay? See, they think dinosaurs died off 65 million years ago, and soft tissue can only last one million years, okay? And God's word says, no, they died off in the flood roughly 4,400 years ago. So 65 million seconds is two years. How many people think I brought this bucket of ice in two years ago? How about, if I, how about uh, in God's perspective, it's uh, 4,400 seconds, that's an hour and 13 minutes ago. How, how many people think I brought it in an hour and 13 minutes ago? Yeah, exactly. We still expect to find ice an hour or two. And even if you put it in the fridge, the perfect environment, it may last a million seconds, you know, 11 days. But am I going to believe that it's two years? No. But that's what they're doing with that soft tissue. And look at their headlines. Dinosaur shocker. Astonishing signs of life. It's not shocking to me. Okay, it says, the findings amazed colleagues who had never imagined that even a trace of still soft dinosaur tissue could survive. After all, as any textbook will tell you, when an animal dies, soft tissues such as blood vessels, muscles, and skin decay and disappear over time. Heart tissue, tissues like bone, may gradually acquire minerals from the environment and become fossils. And also says, if particles of one dinosaur were able to hang around 65 million years, maybe the textbooks are wrong about fossilization. Well, they're close. They're wrong about the date. And take a look at what they teach. For a fossil to form, according to the textbooks, they bury dead organisms that have sunken to the bottom. So something dies, and it, and it sinks, and then it gets buried. Again, animal dies, falls to the bottom of a lake or swamp, and sinks, okay, and gets buried. Animal dies, sinks to the bottom, gets covered in sediment, turns into a fossil. All right, has anybody ever had goldfish? Anybody ever seen a dead fish? Is that on the top or on the bottom? Top. It's on the top. Dead things, dead things float and float, and they go to the top, and then they get eaten up. The mere existence of a fossil proves that it was buried rapidly. Right? That deer on the side of the road is not turning into a fossil. Okay, it had to be buried rapidly. Therefore, that layer of rock that has fossils in it was laid down rapidly, not over millions of years. So the only way it forms is, it's, I'd say, the fossil record is a sign of a worldwide flood in the days of Noah, not millions of years. And there's a lot of problems with that fossil record, and we'll get to that. Okay, anybody know what I'm holding right there? What kind of fish? Jellyfish. Does that have any bones and hard tissues? No. no. According to the textbook, should that turn into a fossil? No. No. But guess what they have at Institute for Creation Research? They got this fossil specifically because Darwin said it couldn't happen. A fossil jellyfish. And does it take millions of years for something to st turn into stone? <laughs> you guys aren't going to get nightmares, right? This is my favorite fossil. You guys sure? You guys can handle it? Okay, get ready to cover your eyes. My favorite fossil, a fossil hat. <laughs> Do you think those dinosaurs were wearing hats around? No, this was a, they cut, shut down a cave in Australia, a mine in Australia, they went back roughly 50 years later and it had turned into, turned into stone. This one, I think they hang this in a cave that has a lot of mineral running through the water and hang it in the waterfall. Teddy bear, or did the dinosaurs have teddy bear? Help them sleep a little bit. Okay, now if you have a pen, or just imagine, off to the right, just picture a, a, a stick man and a line underneath it, and then put your name next to it. So where did you come from? Right? Who can answer that? Where did you come from, ultimately? Where? God. God. And then God did what? Created what? Animals. Animals. I'm looking for a name. Yes. Yeah. Adam and Eve. That's right. Where did Eve come from? Adam. Adam. That's right. I was on the radio one time, and the guy says, uh, well, doesn't the Bible say that uh, man came from the dust of the earth? And I said, yeah, that's right. He goes, well, that's evolution. That's what evolution says. That man came from the dust of the earth. That Genesis, that's just an analogy. And I said, well, the Bible also says that the first woman came from the first man's rib. How does that fit into your analogy? It doesn't. 
Okay? So Adam, we came from Adam, right? How do we know that? God said so in his book. What's our assumption? God, there is a God, and he can communicate clearly in a book. That's our one assumption, or two assumptions. All right? But notice over here, where do the people who don't believe in God, where did we come from? Came from ape-like ancestors, right? So what's their assumption? Our great-great-great-great-great-great-grandma looked like that. <laughs> Married to our great-great-great-great-great-grandpa. <laughs> and did we have a family reunion with our great-great-great-uncle? <laughs> and our other cousin from the other side? <laughs> and this one? No. That's our aunt? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. so. Ultimately, that's what's in our textbooks. We had ape-like ancestors, and it's the, le the, the depths we go through for that. Okay, so did dinosaurs live with man? According to the Bible, God made the land animals, made Adam and Eve. Okay, question, as, it, as it detectives, there's legends all over the world describing these big reptiles, but what did they call them? The word dinosaur hadn't been invented. What did they call those big ones? Real loud. Dragons, that's right. Legends all over the world talk about these dragons, another word for a dinosaur. It bothered Carl Sagan so much he wrote a book trying to explain it. How could all these cultures, separated by time and distance and mileage, and, and he called it Dragons of Eden. And his idea was our memories got passed down in our dirt DNA for millions of years. And that's been debunked. Marco Polo said that he saw dragons that pulled chariots in the Emperor's Parade. How about this? What does that look like? What kind of dinosaur? Stegosaurus! That was carved in a temple a thousand years ago. We didn't find the first dinosaur bones until 1800s. We've only had dinosaur bones for about 200 years. The word dinosaur hasn't even been around 200 years. How in the world, Mr. Detective and Mrs. Detective and Miss Detective, can somebody who's never seen one of these carve something in a temple a thousand years ago? He must have seen it. Notice the circles. These are the Ica stones of Peru, and I've got a, a science journal where they, where they validated these things are roughly a thousand years old. And the conquistadors went through there in the 1500s and said, we see rocks with strange creatures carved in them. What are those strange creatures, class? Dinosaurs. Really loud? Yeah, dinosaurs. Notice the circles. Dinosaurs. How could they carve them anatomically correct if they'd never seen them? And this, this journal validated that it's true, and also castles in Europe have dragons carved in them. How could you carve a dragon if you've never seen them? And they'll say, well, they're just carving legends. Remember the circles on the skin? You gotta be pretty good at carving a legend to know what its skin looks like. So the evidence is getting pretty strong that these dinosaurs lived with man. And you also always see these long-necked dinosaurs with their necks crossed. This is in a castle. Bishop Bell's Brass Behemoths is what they call this. It was built in 1496, so that's roughly two or three hundred years before they found the fossil bones. Class, how could somebody carve something if they'd never seen it? Makes no sense. And they're always, always with their necks crossed. Why are they always with their necks crossed? Well, giraffes, somebody put words to this. The first words are, look at her, she's all neck and legs. Neck and legs, look at her. So the giraffes do that. Maybe the long-necked dinosaurs did in the past. Okay, so now, um, which, which one does the, yes? Um, and also there was a single footprint next to a dinosaur. That's right, that's right, absolutely. Carl Ba, I've talked to him, he's one that discovered it. Discovered one of them. And he couldn't sleep for three or four days because he believed in that theistic evolution. God made something that evolved. And he believed that. But then he saw the footprint of a human next to a dinosaur. His whole worldview came crashing down. It's like, oh my gosh, God did mean what he said. And so he's actually, Carl Baugh going to be speaking in Chicago this summer at the Grace Conference. I encourage you, anybody who wants to go, to go. Okay, class, which side makes the most sense? That hydrogen and helium turns into dinosaur or that God created the dinosaur? God created the dinosaur. Yeah, exactly, I agree. I agree. Are you guys all homeschooled? 
Most of you, has anyone been, been to a government school? No. I'm a product of the government school, and I've had classes like this. So today I'm going to share with you the most important, most significant, most profound lecture and the reasons that we do what we do. The importance of formatting and documenting your work in the modern language style. You will notice that this is the seventh edition. I will not accept anything less than the seventh edition, which is the most current, up-to-date, most accurate information available from the Modern Language Association. The Modern Language Association is a very convenient, somewhat cumbersome, but expedient way to do your documentation. And we are using what edition? And what edition will we be using, class? Class? Oh, those are the worst classes. They, they, sometimes they have a supernatural talent to make the clock go backwards. I don't know how they do it. But anyhow, if God's word is true, let's see what God has to say about dinosaurs, shall we? And this is from Ken Ham. He's got a talk, Dinosaurs for Kids, and does an excellent job on this part. The seven ages of dinosaurs, they were formed. They were formed on the sixth day, just like God said. And then he said, let us make man in our image. So God made the land animals. They were formed. And then they were fearless. Did Adam have to worry about the T-Rex eating them? What do you think? No. No? Who thinks they had to worry about it? Who thinks they don't have to worry about it? All right. Okay. Well, I agree. You know, the, somebody said that they're carnivores. They got sharp teeth. Well, that's what the textbooks say. Carnivores eat meat, and they got sharp teeth. Well, here's a shark that prefers vegetables. Here's a lion that never ate meat, little tyke. The owner was given a tour of their ranch and says they're concerned because it doesn't eat meat. And a little kid, just a little kid said, don't you read your Bible? He goes, what do you mean? She said, Genesis 1.30. So as fast as he could, he went to his Bible and it said, and every beast of the earth and to every fowl of the air and to everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there's a life, I have given every green herb for meat and it was so. So everybody was vegetarian at the beginning. Everything was very good. Look at this, sharp teeth. Does he eat meat? No, he eats bamboo. Sharp teeth, vicious meat eater. No, it's Chinese water deer. Sharp teeth, vicious meat eater, right? No, it's a, it's a fruit bat. Sharp teeth, eats meat, according to the textbooks, right? No, it's a vegetarian monkey. All right, so just because it's in the textbook doesn't mean it's accurate. And by the way, God said everything was very good very good. Do we live in a very good world? Do we? I mean, people die. Is that very good? No. No, it's not. So our obvious question is, well, what happened? Well, boys and girls, this is the worst day there's ever been. This is the fall. God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest of it thou shalt surely die. So God said, don't eat, the meat. Don't eat from that tree. That's his truth. When you eat from it, you're going to die. But the serpent was more subtle than all the beasts of the field. He went to the woman and said, Yea, hath God said. Doubt God's word. Yea, hath God said. Change the meaning of words. Yea, hath God said. That's what I did when I read the Bible. I didn't believe Adam lived to be 900 years. I believed he'd be 900 months. That's 72 years. But no, they did. I do another talk. What, what was it like before the flood? Yea, hath God said, ye shall surely die. Ye shall be as gods. And so what did Eve do? She saw that the tree was good and pleasant to the eyes and desired to make one wise. And she took the fruit thereof and did eat and gave some to her husband. This is the first marriage. God defines marriage. Husband, one man, one woman. And with her, and he did eat. And that's when death entered into the world. Man brought death into the world. The other thing is, evolution just came. Death has always been here. And so they knew that they had sinned. They saw they were naked. And so they sewed together fig leaves and made themselves aprons. See, our works aren't going to take away sin. God came and he made coats of skin and clothed them. There was, that was the first death. Okay, because of man's sin, animals died. And there was a shed blood. God has to take care of the sin. We can't, our works aren't good enough. And then it got bad. Cain killed Abel, and it got, went downhill from there. 
And it got to the point where the imagines of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The whole world was wicked. I think it's bad now. Just think, of, well, it's back then. And so God sent what? The flood. I will destroy man whom I have created upon the face, both man and beast and creeping thing and the fowls of the air. He said a worldwide catastrophic flood that buried billions of dead things in layers of rock that were laid down by water. That's evidence of the fossil record. All right? And some people say, well, that's just a local flood. When they try and squeeze evolution into the Bible, they have to have a local flood. And, but listen to this, or else they'll say it's poetic. You know, it's not historical. It's just a figurative language. Listen to the language here. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, in the 17th day of the month. Does that sound poetic? That day is described more thoroughly than almost any other day in the Bible. That's history. It's history. God's telling us a historical event. And Jesus referred to it as a historical event, accurate historical event. So when we're not referring to Genesis as an accurate historical event, we're not following the example of Jesus. And unfortunately, most of our seminaries and so-called Christian colleges do not believe it as an accurate historical event. They teach some form of evolution. Okay, so were there dinosaurs on the ark? What do you think? Who thinks there were dinosaurs on the ark? Who doesn't think there were dinosaurs on the ark? I mean, how do you get something that big in that boat? Well, how big was the boat? Was the boat bigger than that building? That's me right there, stepping it off. 300-foot building. Was the ark bigger than that? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's 450 at least. Anybody ever been to the ark? And You've been to the ark? Yeah, it's huge. I think it's beautiful. So how do you get something as big as an airplane through that little door? How do you do that? Anybody have an answer? What? No, that's not it. Close. No? That's right. You take the babies. Take the young ones. Take the young ones. They'll fit through there. They won't eat as much. They'll bounce and bite it right back up like you kids do and your parents do. We just lay there for a while when we go down. So it was huge. And this is from the Creation Museum uh, south of Cincinnati. And that's an actual T-Rex egg. All right. That's the biggest egg they've ever found. So the biggest animals were once little. And so then the dinosaurs faded away. Most of them died outside in the flood. There's a few on the ark. They got off the ark and they repopulated, known as dragons. And hence the, dragon, um, the knight kills the dragon. There's legends of them. There's carvings of them. But what happened to them? They got killed for meat. I think they got killed because you don't want little Bobby and Susie playing next to a T-Rex now, do you? You're not going to let them go out in the backyard. Okay, so man killed most of them. So why don't we find the word dinosaur in the Bible? We talked about this. What, was the, what did we call him before dinosaur? Dragon. Dragon. Very good. Very good. Dinosaur wasn't coined until 1841. King James' Bible was translated in 1611. So they used dragons. Watch out which versions you use. You use. Uh, dragons does not appear anywhere in the NIV, but it appears 16 times in the KJV. So just be careful. And now we're going to take a look at Job 40.15. God looks to Job and says, Behold now behemoth. Behemoth. What's a behemoth? Okay. He says, Whatever behemoth is, Job can look at him. This isn't a legend. Behold now behemoth. Job, look at him. Okay. Made with the, he's grass like an ox, so he's not a crocodile. His voice is, uh, the force is in the navel of his belly. So whatever this behemoth is had a big belly. Okay, this uh, Catholic Bible says it was an elephant. This, uh, well, no, the NIV, well, that one is NIV, this one's Catholic. Say so it was a hippopotamus. Hippos have big bellies. Well, if it's all it takes to be a behemoth is to have a big belly. <laughs> is that behemoth? No, 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 no. We have to keep reading. He moves his tail like a cedar. That's a big tree, a big, big tree, like a pine tree. Is that a cedar tree? No, that's not a cedar tree. Is that a cedar tree? No, it's not a cedar tree. Well, how about this? Would that be a cedar tree? Could God be showing Job? Hey, Job, take a look at Behemoth. This big animal that couldn't even fit in this room. I made him. I made him. All right. <clears throat> and so they faded away, and then they were found in the 1800s. So we haven't even had dinosaur... We've had dinosaur fossils for roughly 200 years, just over 200 years now. Okay, and then the word dinosaur was invented in 1841. 
who saw this? This was in, uh, oh, when was this? 2013, I think it was. This was on the internet. Washed up on the beach in Spain. Okay, and I told my wife, they're gonna say it's a shark, they're gonna say it's a shark, they're gonna say it's a shark. And a few hours later, it's definitely a shark. Because that's what they do. There was, and we might even get to that. Oh, I took it out. But they pulled up a plesiosaur, so it's like a marine dinosaur with the long neck and stuff, and they said it was a basking shark. And now there's fiction, right? Fiction. We're not the only fishers of men class. Fiction. Millions of years. What does millions of years just do? It says God didn't mean what he said. And they get them off on that class when you're really young. Not hundreds, not thousands, but millions of years long before you were born. Right? So your kid gets on the wrong track when they're young. They may never come back. So what you're doing, parent and kids, if your parents are homeschooling you, man, thank your lucky stars for that. They want what's best for you. Don't give them a hard time. Do your homework when you have to. They, they, they know, and for your parents, thank God for what you're doing. You see the value in what's being taught to your children. And now you know what they're teaching the kids in uh, California? Kindergartners? There's like 15 genders. How confused is that kid going to be? You know, and so... Just, so you have to be very good at uh, separating the facts from the fictions. Does the world, does encyclopedia have fiction, fairy tales? This was the big hurdle for me when I saw it. You mean the encyclopedias are wrong? And I'll say, yeah. When they talk about stuff we haven't seen before, millions of years. Uh, who's ever climbed Eagle Mountain in Minnesota, the highest point? You take hike, you get up there, and guess what they have? They got a plaque that says the rock is billions of years. So you're going to see this millions and billions of years at every taxpayer-funded event. Okay? And the people that don't do it is Pensacola Christian College. That's where him Prowl is going. And if anybody wants to make a donation, just write a check out to Pensacola Christian College, put it in the back, or call them up and say, I want to donate to him. As you guys look for colleges, go ahead and check, check that one out. Room board and tuition is ten grand. You get a summer job, get free room and board, and you pay off like a semester of school. And you're going to hear God's perspective of it. And now I just want you to hear, and you, Bill and I will say this a lot, the atheist altar call. We have to teach evolution. Evolution is the foundation for science, and we have to teach evolution, or we're going to fall behind the other countries. Listen to this talk. Hi, my name is Dr. Raymond Damadian. I am a young Earth creation scientist and believe that God created the world in six 24-hour days, just as recorded in the book of Genesis. By God's grace and the devoted prayers of my godly mother-in-law, I invented the MRI scanner in 1969. The idea that scientists who believe the Earth is 6,000 years old cannot do real science is simply wrong. Simply wrong. If they ever tell you evolution is the foundation for science, they really, it had nothing to do with the MRI. But the interesting thing, he invented the MRI his MRI is in the Smithsonian. He's got the first patent on the MRI. Did he get the Nobel Prize for the MRI? No. No. No, so there's a bias against creationists and Christians. And so there's the seven ages of dinosaurs. They were formed, they didn't eat meat. And then we sinned, and then death entered into the world, and that's when they started eating meat. And then there's the flood, then it was faded, and they were found, and now there's fiction. Okay, now we're wrapping up, kids. This is your time to shine. I want you to yell out these questions. All right, the golden questions first, all right? Could you help me understand that better? Really loud. Could you help me understand that better? Very good. Ask that your whole life. And also, what do you mean by assumption? Here we go. What do you mean by assumption? All right, and they're going to tell you that dinosaurs evolved from a single living cell, and you ask, where did that come from? Really loud. That's right. And how do you know that? How do you know that? They can believe it. They don't know it. And has it ever been observed? Has it ever been observed? Have we ever seen dinosaurs coming from that? No. No, we haven't. And finally, the last one. Are you making any assumptions? Here we go. Go ahead. Are you making any assumptions? That's it. And so if the Bible's true about what he says about dinosaurs, and he is, the question is, where are you going to go if you were to die? You know, as this, 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 this dinosaur is getting buried in mud roughly 4,400 years ago, there was eight people in an ark that escaped God's judgment. 
They escaped God's judgment because they were in the ark. If you want to escape the future judgment, you need to be in Christ. And you need, to, you need to receive this free gift of eternal life that's been bought and paid for by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. It's a free gift. You don't work for it. You don't earn it. It's a gift. For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And how do you receive this? You receive it by believing the gospel. For it is the power of God unto the salvation to everyone that believes. And the gospel is the good news that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And with that, let's close in a quick prayer. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.